Hello and welcome to the 2020 IWMF Virtual Educational Forum. This exciting virtual experience is brought to you by the International Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia Foundation and is supported in part by title sponsors Beijing Pharmaceuticals, Pharmacyclics, and Janssen. We hope you'll explore this virtual environment and experience all that this year's Virtual Educational Forum has to offer. On the left side of your screen, you'll find several navigational buttons. To listen to our featured speaker presentations, simply click Auditorium. To download and view speaker bios, PowerPoint slides, and other educational materials, click Resources. This year's Virtual Educational Forum has something for everyone, so be sure to look around and visit each area. If you need help, click on the Help Desk in the lobby for a quick guide to understanding your virtual environment. If you need help accessing the virtual conference, you can use the virtual environment phone or email support. Please keep this information handy in the event of needing assistance. You can call toll-free at 1-800-217-3966 or internationally at 720-465-8619. You can email support at virtualshow.support at on24.com. If you need help while attending a session, please use the technical support box located in the audience console for assistance. Thank you for attending the 2020 IWMF Virtual Educational Forum, and please enjoy. Hello, everyone. I'm Newton Guerin, IWMF President and CEO. And on behalf of our Board of Trustees and our Home Office staff, I'd like to welcome you back to the 2020 Virtual Ed Forum. If you're just joining us for the first time, we're glad to have you with us. You know, this is our 25th Ed Forum, but our first ever Virtual Ed Forum. One of the obstacles that we're all dealing with during these very challenging times is just trying to stay connected with each other. This pandemic has really created uh, a very unique opportunity for the IWMF uh, through this Virtual Ed Forum to connect with a much larger global audience than, than ever before. We're expecting over 1,000 participants from 30 countries throughout the world. This will be our largest attendance ever. And I would like to thank our sponsors for making this program possible by providing underwriting to enable the IWMF to offer this program at no cost to our participants. A special thank you to our title sponsors, Beijing Pharmaceuticals, Pharmacyclics, and Janssen Biotech, along with other sponsors, Selectar Biosciences, the Treadway Foundation, and X4 Pharmaceuticals. You know, none of these sponsors have influenced our program or its content in any way they all recognize that the IWMF is a leading source of accurate and up-to-date information, and they fully support our commitment to providing independent information to our patients and caregivers. We do have a very full agenda today. We're gonna to kick things off with a presentation by Dr. Stephen Ansel, and we'll wrap up with the always popular Ask the Doctor session. Also, because our time is limited, in this educational forum, the virtual event, we are going to supplement our program by adding a series of global educational webinars. So please check out the IWMF website events calendar for full details uh, about speakers and topics. I hope you were all able to join us this morning for our fourth annual Walk for Waldenstrom's kickoff. This is our most successful event ever. So a huge thanks to all of our walkers and all of our donors. And if you haven't signed up, there's still plenty of time. We're going to continue this, this event through the end of the year. And it really is a, a great uh, and an easy way to raise money for the IWMF and at the same time create awareness about the impact of WM on the lives of patients and caregivers. You know, the IWMF is here to support and educate everyone affected by WM. 
while advancing the search for a cure. Our vision is very simple, a world without WM. Since 1999, the, the IWMF has funded over $18 million in research grants to 50 scientists throughout the world. Their work has already resulted in better therapies, better treatments, and brought us closer to our cure. We're very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Stephen Ansel, one of the nation's leading experts in Waldenstrom's. Dr. Ansel is Professor of Medicine, Division of Hematology, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. We really appreciate his commitment to the work of the IWMF, our mission, and we value and appreciate his dedication in caring for patients living with blood cancers. His topic today is Strategic Research Roadmap, Getting to a World Without WM. We'll have time for questions at the conclusion of this presentation. We want to thank Dr. Ansel and all of our EdForm uh, presenters for volunteering their time and sharing their knowledge and expertise. You can learn more about all of our speakers by visiting the Resource Center. It is now my pleasure to present Dr. Stephen Ansel. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me join the uh, IWMF uh, Virtual Education Forum 2020. These are indeed strange times, but uh, it's certainly a delight to be able to participate in this uh, virtual meeting and share with you a little bit <clears throat> about the strategic research roadmap. And as you can see from the title, talking about how we may get to a world without Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. So the goal of my talk today is to share with you kind of what the vision for research is for the IWMF and mostly to enlist your partnership and your enthusiasm for participating in uh, the work of this roadmap. So um, as I start off here, <clears throat> really just wanted to say we're going to talk about three main things. The first thing I think is to bring you back to what you've been learning all the way along and that is what is unique and unusual about Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. You've already learned so far it's an uncommon disease, but over the last 10 or 15 years, we have learned a lot about the biology of this disease. And I think as uh, I'll illustrate in just a few minutes here, <clears throat> as we've learned a lot about the biology, it's given us treatment options. And that's really what uh, I want to share. Um, but I think what I also want you to see as we go through the talk is that we have a lot more to learn. We are not quite at the point where we're ready to say we're going to have a cure any minute. We certainly have effective therapies and cure is certainly something that's in the future, but we have work to do to get there. So that brings us to the second thing we'll talk about is why do you need a strategic roadmap? And the question is, how does that inform what we need to do? And I'll share with you at this point um, about exactly what some of the thinking is areas that we need to spend more time investing in and how to do that. And then how will supporting the roadmap help? And I think that's the important part and that's where you come in, is we need to get to a world without Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, but the funding, as I'll show you as we go through, that has been provided by the IWMF has made a dramatic impact uh, on this disease and is allowing us really to make major moves forward to understand the biology and to uh, certainly come up with new therapies that are gonna impact the outcome of patients. <clears throat> so as you've been learning, as we've been going through, and as you've been hearing uh, and looking and, and, and watching many of the IWMF uh, educational sessions, you'll know that Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia is unique because it really is a disease with two problems. And the biggest problem is the fact that you have a very large protein molecule circulating in the blood this monoclonal IgM protein, as well as a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma problem in the bone marrow. So again, I think it's important to understand that this is a disease where a genetic change has happened in a normal process. And when that genetic change happened, the process was no longer normal, but switched over to a cancer problem. So what that means is normally when, when you're fighting off an infection, if you breathe in a pollen or bacteria or virus, the way in which your body responds 
is for lymphocytes to change their nature to plasma cells. And as they do that, they start to make an antibody. And the first antibody they make is IgM. And then as they get a little bit more trained as to what the threat is, they change that antibody from an IgM to an IgG. When you have a process where, it has, where a genetic mistake has happened, that's in this process of lymphoplasmacytic change, hence the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, moving from a lymphocyte to a plasma cell, that's where the mistake happened. And then what is being made is the first of those antibodies, the IgM antibody. And as you can see in the picture here, it's a big molecule. It's actually five antibodies, all kind of in a cluster, and that allows it to stick to the, let's say, bacteria or virus or whatever, and trap it and get the immune system to attack. But the problem is that big protein causes problems with patients when the levels are very high in the blood. So I really just wanted to highlight the main things that I think uh, one needs to know. Firstly, talking about this lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma that's in the bone marrow. You can see here with the arrows at these more plasmacytic looking cells. These smaller cells here are more lymphocytic that you can see, so hence the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. And as you've been hearing, we've learned a lot about what these cells specifically look like. This bluish color is all the IgM that's inside of them that they're producing. And we know a lot about their genetics. We know that uh, the uh, MYD88 uh, uh, adapter protein, there's a mutation in the gene, the L265P, and that's the most common mutation in almost all patients with Waldenstrom's have that. And as you've probably been, been hearing too, there is more information about deletions of chromosome 6 and the CXCR4 mutation, which happen in a subset of patients, usually around a third, which tell us more about the biology. So we've learned a lot about this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate that is present within the bone marrow. Equally, I think it's important to realize the other part of the problem is this IgM protein. And you can see again, I've shown this picture where it's a large molecule and it causes a lot of problems, basically number one, because it makes the blood thick. And as the blood circulates around and it's much thicker than normal, the actual ability to carry oxygen and the like actually is significantly affected. Plus, as I mentioned before, it's very sticky. So it actually will stick to body tissues. It'll stick to nerves. It'll stick to skin. It'll stick to even uh, other organs, and when it does that, it actually then causes deposition of protein, which causes those tissues to not work the way they're supposed to. And finally, when it actually sticks to other things, the body doesn't like that, and many times will take out antibody-coated cells, and that can cause anemia and other problems. I'm just going to highlight a few of these things here. Again, just to say, remember we said that the blood can get super thick, and you can see that's where you can get significant problems. Many times you'll have an eye exam, and the reason is you can tell these blood vessels are much thicker, and there's actually some bleeding that's happening into the, in the eye because of the thick protein that's uh, sort of affecting the way in which the blood moves through the blood vessels in the eye. You can see this white stuff that you can see on a CT scan of somebody's brain. That's not normal. And what that is, again, is blood flow through the brain is actually significantly impaired. And people will be confused and sleepy and don't think straight and can have all kinds of neurological complications because their flow of blood through their brain is not normal. Here you can see flow through the uh, <clears throat> blood vessels to the feet is limited and this person has significant ulceration that you can get. And here you can see Raynaud's phenomenon where the fingers go super white as you can tell because the blood flow is significantly limited. So that was the blood doesn't flow very well. Remember I said the second problem that can happen is thing the, the protein is deposited in tissue. And you can see that shown here. It's kind of green stuff that you can see. You can get a process called amyloidosis, which then causes the, the tissues to malfunction when it deposits. This is where people can get significant neuropathy. And what you can tell is this person's foot's angle is kind of a little out of, uh, not normal. And the reason for that is, again, the nerves are malfunctioning. And so the muscles are not really holding the, the, the foot in a normal kind of uh, position. Right in the middle, you can see an EMG test where they'll actually test the, 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 how quickly uh, uh, electricity, as it were, or messages travel through nerves. And those can be significantly compromised. 
again, because this IgM deposits on the nerve, the macrophages, the trash collectors in your body kind of munch that uh, antibody off. But really what it does is it pulls the coating off your wiring in your, in your nerves. And when that happens, those wires short circuit, which then cause the nerves to malfunction. So the first thing, the problem was the fact that you had too much and too thick blood. Now you've actually got this deposition problem. And then finally, you can see here where the antibodies are actually sticking uh, to red cells and causing one of two problems. Here, what you can see are these really small red blood cells, and that's because <clears throat> the antibody that's coated on the outside gets munched off by macrophages, so the cells become very small, and that is, causes an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And here you can see all of these cells kind of clustered together, and that's causing what's called cold agglutinin disease. So basically, when they all get clustered together like that, they get taken out by the spleen, and one becomes anemic in both circumstances. So multiple ways in which not only does the bone marrow get affected, but the blood gets affected. And we've learned a lot about this over the course of many years. But we're not done yet, and shown in this picture, there's still multiple ways in which we need to understand more, not only about why and how the tumor cells function, but also what's unique about the protein. Just as an example, you can have some people who have a protein level of only 3,500 or something milligrams, and they have a lot of problems with the protein. There are other people who have 10,000 uh, milligrams of protein, and they have no trouble. And we don't really understand how the protein causes some people to have lots of problems and others to have far less. What I'm going to do is highlight a number of the knowledge gaps and how the roadmap is really addressing that. So the roadmap is a a document that uh, allows us to really think about what are the areas in which we want to make progress. And a number of experts around the world have got together repeatedly over the years and addressed what we feel are the key areas where we need to know more. And in essence, there are four areas, and I'm going to just explain what they are and then highlight some of the progress that's been made. So the four areas are in signaling, and that really means how the cell talks to itself and how it passes messages around the cell. Omics, and that's a very general broad term, and you heard me talk about some of the genetics a minute ago. So you have the genomics, you have epigenomics, you have proteomics, you have metabolo metabolomics, you have transcriptomics. All of those areas are ways in which the information that is coded in the cell is then shared with, uh, with the rest of the cell, so the cell knows what to do. The third area is the area of immunology, and that is why a, a discussion about why the body allows these cells to grow out of control. Why do the police, if you like, not actually take care of these cells and get rid of them entirely? And finally, the fourth area is the bone marrow microenvironment, the, the niche in which the cells like to live. So many people will know that you can get the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma in your lymph nodes. You can get it sometimes in the spleen, but most of the time it likes to be in the bone marrow. What is it about the bone marrow that is such a friendly place that's allowing these cancer cells to grow? Could we do something to change it and make it a little less friendly? It's a little bit like having a crack house in your neighborhood. If you got rid of that, a lot of the troublemakers in the neighborhood would be cleared out and we want to make the neighborhood cleaned up as best we can. So the first thing to talk about is signaling. So of the four things that are the key pillars, if you like, of the roadmap, signaling in Waldenstrom's macroglobin anemia and why it matters. So you can see here, this is just a image of all of the different pathways and signaling. It's like a wiring diagram, if you like, of all of the messages that are passed around in the cell Many of these are very active or even overactive, causing the cancer cells to grow and make lots of IgM protein. And you may look at this and go, gosh, that's unbelievably complicated. I have no idea how to understand that. And I think in many respects, many doctors do look at that and are equally confused. However, the goal of what we're doing is to try and make that a lot clearer and a lot simpler. So actually, you might go, I look at maps like this all the time, and it makes perfect sense to me. So if you went to England and you went and rode on the, on, on the subway or the underground there, 
you know, you use a map like this all the time. You would, same if you went to New York or any place like that, it's very clear that when it's mapped out in a way that you can understand which station you get on, on which station you get off at, and it's all clear and where you change and how you change, you can navigate this in a much more useful way. This is true too when we're trying to understand how cancer cells utilize information. The better we understand it, the better we can say that if we blocked the uh, travel of information between one spot and another, that would significantly impact the cell and cause it to die off. And that's really the goal of what we're trying to do. And actually, to be honest, a lot of progress has been made. There's a very nice review article that came from Dr. Trion's group, and this is just highlighting some of the information that we know with a focus on what are called toll-like receptors, cytokine receptors, and the B-cell receptor, all of which are kind of, as you can see here, focused around this MYD88 protein. And all of these other proteins that intersect with what is called the mitosome, which really allows us then to understand how it signals to promote the cell and the growth of, of uh, the cell's growth and uh, proliferation and the way in which it makes more cells and the way in which it makes more protein. So a lot of this work has come from funding that's come from the IWMF to successfully be, successfully be able to achieve um, a, a map, if you like, of how there's a pro-survival signaling pathway going on within the uh, cancer cell. And again, how does this help us? Well, we know that if we understand some of these triggers that get the cell signaling, if we understand some of the key molecules that we could interrupt them, we would get uh, better um, advantages with treatment. Um, there are all kinds of inhibitors, inhibitors that inhibit B cell signaling. There are now IRAC inhibitors, BTK inhibitors, ERK inhibitors, AKT, ways in which those can be inhibited, molecules that can inhibit mTOR, all of these are ways in which you can disrupt the favorable pathways that are promoting the growth of these cells. So that was all about how signaling and understanding the pathways would be important. This is now omics. And uh, as you can see, this, uh, this person is saying, do these genes make me look fat? And what they're talking about is your genetic code that you can see right here. And so omics starts with genes. But I think what's really important, I've shared this before and I just want to share it again because I think it helps us understand, is that genomics is the hard, uh, the, the, the hard code, if you like, of how cells operate. But how that code is then translated into how cells work is where epigenomics, proteomics, metabolomics, transcript, transcriptomics and all these things come in. So you might go, wow, I'm kind of freaking out right now. This is way too confusing for me. Well, it really isn't, because if you kind of compare it to here, it works the same as a computer. If you just simply have a computer, as you can see here, but it has nothing loaded on it, it's just a very expensive doorstop. It just is a box that just stands there and does nothing. You need an operating system that's inside that, and then you need programs that are loaded onto that to actually allow that to work. So then you'd, for example, have uh, Adobe Flash, and that would run something like a YouTube, and that allows you then to watch your favorite cat video or whatever. So again, it's the same principle. This is where the code lies. Then the body copies parts of that code to be able to share that with parts of the body that make proteins. Then proteins are made. The proteins are metabolized down to molecules that have function, like cytokines or something along those lines. So again, it's a stepwise process, but all of those change over time. So for example, every single cell has the same code, but the, your hair cells look nothing like your skin cells, look nothing like your heart cells, and the reason is only certain genes are really transcribed all the way down to function. So we need to understand when we're looking at uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, how certain genes are transcribed down and only certain functions are important so that we can disrupt that process in a way that's favorable to curing patients in time. And just to highlight some work that's been done, so firstly just to again remind us that we know a lot about the genetics. We've basically done next generation sequencing on most of the genes 
or on the genes entirely, and we've basically shown that, for example, MYD88, CXCR4, are critical to the understanding of what exactly constitutes Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. But here's a paper that just came out, which I think is really useful, and that is looking at what's called methylation. So methylation is really the ways in which only certain parts of the genes are then allowed to be transcribed or copied, and other parts are covered up. And so it's a little bit like unwrapping only the parts that you want for information, and the rest stay wrapped up so that they don't get transcribed. And if you look at this picture, what they could show is that there are two kinds of Waldenstrom's. They could see this cluster here, and they could see this cluster here. And when they compared and looked at what this whole meta um, uh, the methylome, the ability of to see which genes were switched on and which were not, they could see two clear distinct groups, one that had more of a plasma cell look and others that had more of a memory B cell. So remember the lymphoplasmacytic uh, process that I spoke about? They can see it now based on the genes that are being used versus the genes that are not. And they could show really clearly here that when you looked at the memory B cell versus the plasma cell, you could see all of them have the MYD88, but most of the ones that are CXCR4 land in this group versus far fewer that are in the plasma cell group. You can see these are the ones that majority of them have this deletion 6P in their chromosomes, and almost nobody is in this group. So again, clearly giving us information about certain Waldenstroms that have genes that are turned on, and other Waldenstroms that have, don't have those genes turned on, but have different genes that are turned on. Here's another part of the information that's coming out. So this is from our group, and this is now looking further down at the uh, ability of the cells to make protein. So we are looking here at metabolites. So we're taking the serum from patients and from their bone marrow, and we're looking at differences. And what we showed very clearly here is that glutathione metabolism <clears throat> is significantly up and uh, very much more active when Waldenstrom's is active. And so that's driven a lot by some of these other proteins like IL-6 and IL-21 that we've shown in the past. But, but glutamine down to glutathione really is an important pathway that is fueling these cells. So aside from the ways in which we can target the genes and some of the pathways, we can actually target some of the metabolites and the metabolism pathways. And so more information, I'm sure, will be coming from this area. So you heard us talk a little bit about the signaling and how important that is. You heard us talk a lot about the omics or how the, the body uses genetic information. Here I want to talk a little bit about the third part that really constitutes the uh, Waldenstrom's um, roadmap, and that is the immunology of Waldenstrom's and why it matters. So here you can see a kind of a set of little pictures of all of the different cells that are key parts of your immune system. And what's interesting is the immune system is talking, the cells are talking to each other, helping each other, targeting and fighting against any kind of threat. And you can see here a number of different types of cells. You heard me mention macrophages, the trash collectors, if you like. It's kind of a funny picture. He's kind of salivating away here. But in some respects, that's really true. They eat up any kind of debris. NK cells are kind of your hand-to-hand -hand combat cells. Their job is to kind of be the first responders that get there and uh, the green berets, if you like. These cytotoxic T cells are very focused on going after tumors. Helper cells help to facilitate the success of these cells. Dendritic cells or follicular dendritic cells are the ones that give information to say, this is what we see as a threat. And if you like, they're your kind of communications, information, scout type of cells that will tell the immune system what they need to worry about. Usually B cells and plasma cells are part of your immune system, but in the case of Waldenstrom's, these are now the culprits that are causing the problem. So the challenge is to get all of these other cells to actually focus on their brothers, if you like, as a way now to target them. And that's what's actually made immunology and immunotherapy in cancer, particularly blood cancers, difficult, because you have to get the immune system to turn on itself. And in some respects, they're used to helping each other not fighting each other. So this is the kind of the most important part is to say as a, is how can you get the immune system to recognize a cancer as foreign and it's particularly a blood cancer. So I mentioned to you the dendritic cells being the scouts if you like or maybe it's like your hunting dog or you really want to be able to tell a dendritic cell this is what we're looking for. Here's the bad guy. 
So tell the immune system what it looks like, and it will talk to the CD8 and CD4 cells to share that information with them. When it does that, it's like training the dog by you know, putting the, the rag or something under its nose to say, go and get the owner of this. And you're really trying here to get the T cells to focus on killing malignant B cells. So how would you do that? Well, there are lots of ways in which you would just simply activate cells that are already there. But a lot of you have heard about CAR T cells. And uh, this is just to show a, a little picture again about how that may work. Pretty much what happens with CAR T cells is normal T cell gets a viral vector, which you can see, which is a part of DNA code put into it. This DNA code is for a specific type of a receptor. It's an chimeric antigen receptor. And what that means is it's been engineered to work like a magnet. So in essence, all that's gonna happen is this uh, mean looking CAR T cell that you see in this picture will now stick to the tumor cell. There's actually a binding site that will just stick it to the, to the cancer cell. When it sticks, what happens is the cell becomes activated. And when it becomes activated, it makes multiple copies of itself and it automatically makes proteins, what are called cytokines, and then it makes what are called perforins, which are proteins that make holes in cells to basically kill the cell that it's just been attached to. In other words, you're really trying to make the immune system unbelievably angry and mad, and when you do that, you want it right next to the cancer cell, so it will kill the cancer cell the moment it gets activated. I joke and tell people it's like taking a cat and putting it in a bag, shaking the bag and then letting the cat out. As you can imagine, the cat comes out with its hair standing on end and mad as can be scratching like crazy. And if you put that mad, angry cat right next to something you want scratched, it will obviously scratch it like crazy. So that's where you're taking CAR T cells, putting them right next to the tumor and getting it to attack the tumor. The problem is there are quite a lot of issues with cytokines that get released makes you feel pretty fatigued and weak and high blood pressure that can be low and high fevers, and you can get confused and neurological symptoms. So all of those are challenging, but this has been a very effective therapy, particularly in other kinds of lymphoma. Not a lot of work yet done in Waldenstrom's, but in marginal zone lymphoma, recent data that was published at the ASCO meeting, you can see that a very high response rate, and this is in people that had failed a lot of treatment, and uh, it looks like these uh, responses are durable, although we're gonna need longer follow-up to be able to prove that. So the final thing, again, what I hope you heard is the four areas that we're talking about, signaling number one, omics number two, immunology number three, and this is number four, the bone marrow microenvironment. So this is, again, why does this matter? And you know, Aesop from Aesop's Fables was known to have said, a man is known by the company he keeps. So if you have a neighborhood that's full of characters that look like this, you're going to have a lot of bad behavior. And again, if we're creating a bone marrow environment that's very facilitating and helping cancer cells, that's obviously going to be unfavorable for the patient. If we change the neighborhood so that it does not support the growth of cancer cells, that's clearly going to be beneficial. So the bone marrow microenvironment or the bone marrow niche is again a very complex thing. And you can see here a picture shown of the bone marrow, which you can see in the center. What you can see are multiple different proteins that cause the cells to stay there, proteins that facilitate the success and growth of the cell, the interactions that happen between the cell, the types of structures that need to be around the cell, and quite frankly, we've done very little in understanding this bone marrow microenvironment and niche. We focused a lot on the tumor cell. We focused quite a lot on the proteins and uh, that facilitate its growth. But exactly why it likes to grow in the bone marrow, that's actually very poorly understood. So here is a clearly an area where a lot more work needs to be done. So I guess the key question when all this is said and done, You've heard these four different areas, the roadmap and how this may affect you. And I guess a lot of folks are saying, well, you know, what, you know, why, why should this really be important to me? I guess the main thing is that a lot of the things that we've understood are now directly impacting and benefiting patients. So as we look to the future and as we say, how can we uh, anticipate a world without Waldenstrom's, 
more research in this area that will result in better therapies and probably and likely in therapies that are gonna be curative. So again, just to give you some recent practical information about how this is impacting us, this is data on the CXCR4 uh, uh, mutation. Remember I said that most people have the MYD88 mutation, but only probably around a third have the CXCR4 mutation. And some additional data has shown that the more cells, that's what this clonality means, but the more of the cells that actually have the mutation, the greater the risk that treatments like BTK inhibitors, particularly abrutinib, will be less successful. So what you're seeing here is you get very good outcomes. And you can see this is out now to five years for people that do not have the CXCR4 mutation, but even the ones that do with low clonality, that's actually a really good thing. So we're learning more that it's not just everybody, it's the ones that, the people that have high clonality that are greater risk of disease progression. Again, I still would point out people significantly benefit. Here you are three years, more than half the people are still doing well. Um, but as you can tell over time, they do less well for, for, for and, and not for as long. So again, it just tells us as we choose therapy, as we determine the ways to go uh, in, in giving people the best outcome possible, these kind of genetic information, uh, this kind of genetic information is very helpful. But we're always looking to push the envelope to do more, to have better therapies. And as you heard, there are other BTK inhibitors. This is the data for acalabrutinib using that as a, as a single agent, and this was published this year. And you can see here in a large study of, of like a, uh, over 100 patients, very high numbers of patients benefit. Overall response rate here, almost you know 95%. And if you go, well, how does it look as far as major responses are concerned? You can see these major responses are in the, in the order of 80%. So most people benefiting, a calibrutinib being a therapy with very similar efficacy and benefit to a brutinib. The main question now is which one gives you the same kind of benefit but with fewer side effects and fewer complications. That's what this uh, study that was recently presented uh, was talking about. This is xanabrutinib, yet another one of the BTK inhibitors, and this was compared directly to abrutinib. And as you've probably heard in the meeting so far, that's actually been shown to have very equivalent results. It didn't actually meet its endpoint for being better. It sort of uh, came out as pretty good and, and very similar in its benefit to abrutinib, but the side effect profile might be favorable, more favorable than abrutinib. So I think all told, this just tells us this class of anti of, of, of therapies, BTK inhibitors, uh, whether it be a calibrutinib, ibrutinib, or xanabrutinib, all are highly effective, and it really just depends on which one agrees with a patient the best. Other drugs that are also you know, come out of the research, many of you will have heard uh, this meeting if you've watched the other online uh, educational sessions about venetoclax, so this is a uh, molecule that triggers dying of cells, and um, that's again been very promising, and if you will specifically look here, it's just in the initial studies at the patients that have Waldenstrom's, what this waterfall plot is shows the degree of decrease is the degree of benefit, and you can see most patients having quite a substantial benefit from this agent. So the point of all this is, <clears throat> as we've learned more about the biology, it's translated into information about how to select treatment and also into information about how to utilize treatments that have proven to be highly successful in Waldenstrom's patients. So with that, I'm gonna thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you for your support of research and really encourage you to get behind the IWMF's uh, research roadmap because again, focusing on these areas is making a substantial difference to patient outcome because the more we understand, the better we can make therapy, and then together we can imagine a world without Waldenstrom's because we will have successfully treated each patient in a way that really results in a long-term cure. And that's really what we're all about. So thank you very much again for inviting me to be part of this uh, meeting, and thank you for listening to this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ansel, for explaining the importance and significance of the IWMF's research roadmap to the WM community both now and in the future. On behalf of WM patients and caregivers around the world, 
I'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for your past and continuing dedication to WM patients and to finding better treatments for our very rare form of lymphoma. Now, um, for our first question, I'm actually going to start off with a question that was submitted live. Um, and it's, I guess, somewhat related to the roadmap. Um, there, there's a lot of, most of the newer, uh, more novel agents are being developed in pill format. And in the United States, at least, uh, Medicare uh, may not cover the uh, cost of um, treatments in pill format. Is there any possibility of those things also being available in an, as an infusion delivery option? Yeah, so thanks, Peter, for having me on, and uh, that's a really great question. Uh, and the answer is yes, but there are, it's a little bit more of a nuanced uh, response that one has to give based on the fact that developing drugs actually is quite tricky. So sometimes it depends exactly what drug you're talking about. So, for example, rituximab or rituxin that many people will use cannot be given as an oral uh, medication because it is a protein. So when you were to swallow that, the acid in your stomach will break it down. Many of these small molecule inhibitors that we're talking about, like BTK inhibitors, venetoclax, for example, uh, which is a BCL2 inhibitor, <clears throat> those kinds of molecules, they can potentially be made as intravenous uh, types of treatment. However, often it has to do with how frequently you have to give it because of various enzymes and other uh, molecules in the blood that break it down. So often when it's a pill, it's because that's been the perfect formulation for it to be given in the most convenient fashion. I mean, let's face it, even though it would be nice to get things intravenously, if you have to get it every single day, that's a little tiresome if you have to go in every day for the infusion. So some of the, of the medications that are pills are pills because you have to take them every day or even twice a day, making it very difficult to do that intravenously. Thank you. Uh, okay, our, our next question uh, do, uh, is uh, regards uh, to developing lesions or tumors outside the bone marrow. Any insights on why that occurs and is any research being done in that area? Yeah, that's a, again a very good question. So in general, as most people on the call will know, um, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia likes the bone marrow and the bone marrow environment is very conducive for these cancer cells to accumulate and to grow and develop. However, others will know that you can get enlarged lymph nodes. Sometimes you can get an enlarged spleen as these cells can accumulate other places. And as the, the, the question points out, we have only limited information about why the bone marrow is picked in the majority of patients compared to lymph nodes and spleen and other places in other patients. We do have some clues though. Many of you will have heard from the presentations about CXCR4 and the mutations that we look at there. But that is a chemokine receptor that is kind of, kind of like a homing uh, antenna, if you like, that is on the cell. And it responds to a protein called XCL12 or SDF1. It's stromal-derived factor. And what it means is that's given off by the bone marrow. And so the cells like to go to where the concentration of that protein is highest, and that's in the bone marrow. So the CXCR4 often directs the cell to the bone marrow. However, there are other proteins that can also interact with CXCR4, and one of them is MIF, which is a macrophage inhibitory uh, um, factor, and that actually can direct things more toward like lymph nodes. So I think in general, the reason some patients get lymph node involvement is because a different attracting molecule is attracting them to the lymph node compared to the more typical molecule that attracts them to the bone marrow. But to answer the question more directly, there is research being done, but there's definitely space for more research to be done to understand those environments. Thank you. Uh, next question is, um, with regards to uh, stem cell transplant, is there a best time to have one? And is there any uh, stem cell research being done for WM? That uh, is an important issue, which actually has changed a lot. <clears throat> so um, probably uh, five, 10 years ago, my answer would have been different to what it might be now. And what I mean by that is that when uh, 10 years ago we had very limited treatment options and most of the treatment options were chemico chemicals, chemotherapy kind of options, stem cell transplant really played a more major role 
and it was very important to collect stem cells before you damaged any bone marrow cells and then utilize it at a later point. As uh, the audience knows, this has changed a lot now because we have many, many new drugs now that are very effective and, and approved for use in Waldenstrom's. So because of that, we don't typically use as many of the heavy chemotherapy and fludarabine as one of the drugs we used to use way back, which was pretty hard on the bone marrow. We almost never use that now. So the stem cell transplant has kind of moved later and later and later in patients' uh, disease course. The one time it moves more kind of front and center is if Waldenstrom's changes its nature <clears throat> to a more aggressive lymphoma, something like large cell lymphoma. If that's the case, then it moves right up to the front. So there definitely is being research done, or there is research being done on this. However, I would say that in the world of Waldenstrom's, the role of stem cell transplant has actually become a far more of a minor kind of role than what it might have had in the, in the past. And to be frank, that's actually really good news and a compliment to all of the work that's been done in this disease. Thank you, yes, I agree. Um, next question is, um, uh, with regards, uh, more now we're looking into the roadmap and questions in that regards to the roadmap that you just explained during your presentation. Uh, it seems like we've made advances in understanding WM genomics uh, more so than in other areas of the roadmap. Do you agree? Yes, I do. And I, I think um, part of, of that is as we started off really uh, exploring how to best uh, tackle Waldenstrom's, how best to work toward the cure, the goal has always been to understand ways to kill the cancer cells. So it made all the sense in the world to start right with understanding the genomics of the, of the cancer cell. And so a lot of the work was done in really getting after full understanding of what's happening in the genome or, or the code, if you like, within the cancer cell. And high marks to um, Drs. Trion, Castillo, and others from Dana-Farber who really took a major lead in this area. That's really made a lot of progress which has benefited the field substantially. But I think what we've learned is we've got new treatments that are highly effective, but you haven't heard us use the cure word yet. And so we've understood now that there are other things that we need to know aside from predominantly just the genomics. We need to understand how the genomics impacts the function of the cell. We need to understand the environment of the cell. We need to understand the lack of the adequate immune response to the cell. And as the earlier question was, well, why is it picking the bone marrow versus other places? And we haven't really even got into the nature and understanding the, the biology of the protein. So we're learning that more and more work needs to be done for us to really be able to make the headway we want to make. But I think we have to take, uh, uh, give full credit to the work done already to say that the genomics have actually made us really understand the biology quite substantially and given us uh, major progress uh, to date. However, I think we've got more to do, and, and that's part of why the roadmap exists. Thank you. Uh, next question is, again, regarding the roadmap, uh, uh, kind of follow-up to what you just stated is, which areas of the roadmap do you think deserve extra focus right now from WM researchers? Um, so I think, you know, the reason the roadmap exists and the reason the roadmap is just not one person's opinion, but is a group of experts who gets together to continue to refine that is because each of the four main elements that are highlighted in the, ro highlighted in the roadmap are felt to be critically important to the final plan for cure. So I, I want to dodge this a little bit by saying I don't think that there's any part of the roadmap that needs extra focus to the detriment of the others. I think each one of them is equally important. I will say, though, that there are some areas where we've actually done only a very little bit of work. And so I think there's some space where we can do a lot more. So one of the questions earlier about genomics having done a lot of work, I think we should press ahead. But I think the other sites, are, uh, other areas are areas that also need more attention. Thank you. Yeah. So is it, um, kind of to follow up on that, is it um, a factor of needing more research funding to provide focus on those other areas? or also uh, needing more, let's say, proposals from researchers who want to look into those additional areas of focus? And I think uh, that's a good question, and I would say yes and yes. So, uh, you know, I think uh, researchers typically follow uh, funding opportunities. So when there are more dollars specifically uh, defining specific areas, 
for those who have expertise in that area would obviously pay attention and look to obtain funding and therefore will focus their research on Waldenstrom's. I also think there are experts that um, again uh, encouraged to be part of this uh, roadmap and, and of Waldenstrom's research in general will then further propel the field, the field forward. So I think the roadmap so far has actually brought a bunch of new investigators to the area of Waldenstrom's that weren't involved before, which is very exciting. And I think as we move forward and as uh, this community who have been wonderful in supporting um, research continue to fund research as they have, I think there's every opportunity to do that. Thank you. Uh, the next question. It uh, has to do with CAR T-cell therapies. We hear a lot about them uh, in other types of lymphoma, but not so much in Waldenstrom's. Um, and uh, they're targeting, some of them are targeting both CD19 and CD20 or the BCMA. Um, do you think targeting antigens other than only CD19 might be more successful or even just CAR T-cell therapy in general for WM patients? Right, so I think I'll start with the last part first, and that is to say that I think CAR T-cell therapy is a very promising uh, treatment for patients with Waldenstrom's. The, the issue, and it comes a little bit to the transplant discussion that we had a few slides back, is this has quite a lot of risk and quite a lot of toxicity, but as we're getting more experience, that is coming down. But I think, again, because we have many therapies that are highly successful in controlling the disease, this is a treat CAR T cells or a treatment that, await, that waits a little later in the disease course. Um, certainly, as I say, there's been some uh, research already done on CAR T cells in Waldenstrom's with uh, promising results. Um, I think it's highly effective. The key is just risk versus benefit, and one would need to balance that out very carefully in a disease like Waldenstrom's where the outcomes with standard um, medications, including pills and, and, and mild chemotherapy, can actually give you very excellent long-term results. To the second part of the question, and that is the whole question of should you just target CD19 or should you target, target CD20 or BCMA, which is on a plasma cell, um, I think we're going to see an explosion in the next time, a number of years <clears throat> looking at different ways to do CAR T cell therapy. And the, the start was simply picking uh, a CAR T cell that would have broad application against lots of B cell cancers, like lots of lymphomas. But I think you're going to now see much more specific CAR T cells that are actually able to target multiple uh, targets at the same time. So CD19 and BCMA, CD19, CD20, BCMA, and potentially even other targets added in. They're going to be CAR T cells. They jokingly call them armored cars, which actually are protected from being shut down by the immune system. Some that just target the, the stroma or the, the bunker in which the cancer cell is hiding to blast that open so that you can actually get in. So you're going to see a lot of different CAR, CAR T cells that may even be more successful than where we are right now. But these are early days in that particular therapy uh, course. Thank you. Um, and uh, the next question kind of also uh, follows along the lines of CAR T cells. And uh, do you foresee that CAR T cell would replace uh, autologous stem cell transplants uh, as an option for WM patients? Um, I think that's, again, a, an excellent question. Uh, I think for WM patients, that's a question that's a little further down the line. But right now in aggressive lymphoma patients, that's being tested. So there is a, or actually more than one randomized trial going head to head of an autologous transplant for half the patients and CAR T cell, patient, uh, CAR -T -cell therapy for the other half and comparing to see which results in a better outcome. So again, as everybody is fully aware, autologous transplant is using your own stem cells and really using a very heavy chemo approach. CAR T cells are using your own T cells, but obviously targeting and generating them in a way that they'll go after the tumor. So really completely different approaches, but on the face of it with results that look very similar. I think the key is which of these treatments results in a greater number of patients being disease-free and cured five, 10 years down the line. And that's really what's gonna be, gonna be critical. They have very different side effects. They actually have very different costs so it's going to be important that one is a clear winner for, uh, for CAR T cells to actually become the replacement because CAR T cell therapy probably costs at least 10 times more than an autologous stem cell transplant at this point. 
So I think down the line for Waldenstrom's, it's going to take a little longer for us to actually do that comparative study, and uh, we may need to base our decisions on some of the other trials done in other similar kinds of lymphoma. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the next question is, uh, do you see a role for pdl one inhibitors like Obdivo or Keytruda and WM? Why or why not? Um, well, uh, our lab has actually done quite a lot of research on PD-1 and PD-1 blockade in uh, Waldenstrom's, and we've been very interested in exactly um, how this would work. One of the weird things about uh, Waldenstrom's is that PD-1, which is usually expressed on immune cells like T cells, can actually be expressed on the Waldenstrom cells. So we've done some, uh, some studies and actually have treated patients with um, nivolumab, uh, which is one of the PD-1 uh, inhibiting an antibodies, and it does have benefit, but the benefit is only modest. And I think this is in keeping with what's been seen with other low-grade lymphomas, where it's only a minority of patients that seem to benefit. So we don't fully understand why that would be, because there's a strong uh, biological reason why it should work, but I think what we're learning is this is only one switch in a very complicated uh, immune environment, and if you only flick one switch, you do get a little more light in one corner of the room, but the rest of the room may still be dark, and we may need to do a combination approach to really see the full value of this approach. Thank you. The next question, um, as we learn more about uh, the progression of uh, IgM MGUS to smoldering to active Waldenstrom's, uh, do you foresee that patients in the earlier stages who have markers that are favorable for disease progression uh, might be treated early to prevent development of active, active disease? Yeah, so I think actually that's something that um, would, be, would be wonderful. And there actually has been some work that has uh, led us to understand a, more about who are high-risk patients with um, this uh, MGUS, with the monoclonal gammopathy, uh, and which are, um, are more uh, low-risk patients uh, for progression. And I guess I would actually see this as having two ways that the data could be used. If you knew you were a very low-risk patient, that would actually be very valuable because you might then realize that it may take decades, if ever, that you get to the point where you might need treatment. So knowing that you're a patient with that degree of favorable outcome would be very much a reassuring finding. And not only that, you would specifically be someone who we should not treat early uh, as you would probably just have more complications and side effects from the treatment than benefit from it. On the flip side, when you do have a high-risk uh, monoclonal protein likely to move on to develop uh, Waldenstrom's, that may be a patient where early intervention would be very valuable. And I think as we're getting treatments with less and less side effects, that's very appropriate. Our challenge in the past has been when somebody has really got no symptoms but has a risk for getting symptoms but currently feels well, you want to be very careful not to make them feel much worse by giving them a treatment that may or may not prevent them from getting active disease. So there's a balance between the benefit of holding the disease back versus the risk of actually making them quite a lot worse and then ruining their quality of life while you are holding back what, you, you know, what might still come down the road. Thank you. Yes. Um, the, the next question is, are you seeing more research interest into the pathogenesis and implications of having MYD88 wild-type WM? Uh, it appears that this might be still a largely unexplored area. Right. Um, that actually is a very interesting question because we're doing a lot of work in understanding what MYD88 wild-type uh, lymphoproliferative process means. Because there are some people that look like they have Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia that have wild-type MYD88, um, and we're calling them wild-type WM, but they may actually be something like a marginal zone lymphoma, which is a close cousin to Waldenstrom's, but not exactly the same. Because in Waldenstrom's, 90% of people have a mutated MYD88 gene and in marginal zone lymphoma, only probably 10 to 15% have a mutated MYD88 gene. And yet, if the pathologist looks at them under the microscope, 
they're almost impossible to tell apart. The pathologist often has to talk to the clinician to make sure they understand the context of the patient to be able to make a better, a more definitive diagnosis. So I think with all of that said, this is an area where we may well down the road be able to more clearly define what is true Waldenstrom's what is a, and versus what is a Waldenstrom's lookalike because we may actually manage and treat them differently. So this is a little unexplored as an area, but I wanted to reassure folks that if you were to call those patients marginal zone lymphoma, there's a lot of research going on in marginal zone lymphoma, which I think will then spill over into this cohort of people too. Thank you. Um, and this is a, a follow-up question that um, has to do with MYD88. Um, uh, without MYD88 or CXCR4 mutations, are there upcoming treatments other than bendamustine and Velcade that might be beneficial? So I think, you know, again, um, Dr. Castillo and Dr. Trion and, and their group and other groups have shown that uh, both of those mutations are important in some of the, disease, the, the, the treatment decisions for Waldenstrom's uh, treatment. But I think the important thing is also to know that even with those mutations, there is still clinical benefit that can be had, although it takes longer to happen and it's in a lower percentage of patients, but you can still see benefit with many of the treatments that are being used for typical Waldenstrom's patients. So I think there are going to be additional treatments uh, coming down the road that would actually make this mut these mutations less relevant, but I wouldn't have folks, folks feel a, a little uh, discouraged by the fact that if one of these muta or these mutations are, are absent or present, depending on which one you're talking about, that suddenly treatments like BTK inhibition would be of no value. That said, though, I do think there are other uh, inhibitors that are targeting the whole pathway, going after molecules like IRAC and others, and uh, I think we're going to see real benefit for uh, patients when they're treated with that. The other thing that's really exciting is, uh, and the question was asked earlier, what about immun immunology and is there progress being made there? There are now what we call bispecific antibodies. There are also some CD19 antibodies that are now becoming approved, and all of these would be useful in patients with, uh, with Waldenstrom. So I see a lot of additional drugs being able to be applied to Waldenstrom's patients so that everyone will benefit. Thank you. Um, another follow-up question that uh, is not on the next slide. Uh, uh, there's a question asked about, uh, with regards to the research roadmap, um, do you see that there is a, a good deal of cooperation between doctors around the world on this? Uh, do you see it improving? I do, and I think, again, uh, I see, uh, number one, just having folks come together to define what they think are the priorities, and that's done through the roadmap meeting. That's also done through some of the uh, Waldenstrom-specific conferences. I think folks are unifying their ideas and working together. I think the other thing that's been exciting, there have been a number of randomized trials that uh, uh, the Ed Forum is highlighting that have been international collaborations between doctors who treat Waldenstrom's to specifically test best therapies. And I think uh, these days uh, there is such a quick dissemination of information, it really allows people to stay up to, up to date and up to speed on what other groups are doing. So I think all told, compared to 20 years ago, the collaboration has been substantially greater. And I think when you look at different groups that work together, you'll see publications that have names of multiple institutions on the publications confirming that people are working together. Thank you. That, that's good news. Um, uh, another question, a follow-up question is, um, this is more has to do with the research. Um, and I'm going to try and read this properly. Um, uh, the statement is, ideally, the scientific method works best when you have only one variable. But it seems that cancers like WM have many pathways, if you've, as you've already uh, mentioned, um, and the most effective approach might be combination therapies, even uh, multifaceted combinations. So that can become very complex when you're doing the research to test in the usual scientific approach. Um, the question is, is it time to loosen the standard of proof in uh, assessing the results of those types of trials? Yeah, so that's again a very good question and the uh, question uh, uh, creates, uh, illustrates an important point and that, that is that there are 
multiple variables in the, in the an analysis that have to be factored in. And that does complicate the ability to, uh, to draw conclusions. The only thing I would be cautious about is sort of uh, lifting or uh, making the burden of proof less or lower. And the reason that uh, is something that I would push back on is if I'm a patient, I don't want to get a treatment that may or may not possibly had modest benefit. I want treatment that's going to cure me. I want to be right at the cutting edge of what's going to actually get rid of my disease entirely. So I actually think the multiple variables have re made the requirement for the burden of proof higher rather than lower. So in other words, if you get treated with a, with a treatment, even though combinations may be the future, you need to prove that the single treatment that you're giving is highly successful, even though it probably doesn't overcome every single one of the variables. If it's only modestly improved, helpful, I think that needs to be thrown away because you want to take highly effective therapies and use them in combination because that's how you get to a cure. So I think the multiple variable point is very well taken. I do think, though, that the burden of proof for success and what really it will make it as a treatment has actually gone up, and you need to have a highly successful therapy that then gets used in combination before we would really regard it as worthwhile for patients for the future. Thank you. Um, and another uh, follow-up question uh, that uh, it came from one of our listeners is, um, and I, I, I kind of know the answer to this because I'm on the board, but I figured I'd give you the question so that we have an answer for people. Um, regarding the roadmap, uh, are there certain, um, uh, let's say, dollar amounts that are targeted for different aspects of the research roadmap? Uh, how are the decisions made as to which areas to focus and which areas to fund in any given year? Yeah, so that's again a very important question. So um, number one, the roadmap defines the areas that are felt to be priorities. A um, request for proposals for research then goes out and uh, we're asking people to propose research projects that fit with the roadmap. Those then have a deadline, usually in February, for people to uh, submit their applications. And there is a committee of world-renowned researchers, many of them people that received funding for Waldenstrom's from the IWMF before, that meet in a conference that basically review all of the applicants and rank them in order of what they feel scientific merit. Depending on how much funding IWMF has, they can then go down that ranking and fund as many of the projects as, as, they, uh, as they wish. To be frank, um, there are actually now two tiers of, um, of patients, uh, of, of applicants that are, uh, are being considered. There are those that are senior researchers, and the funding is greater for those. And then there are now junior and sort of upcoming investigators that we would, are planning to fund to bring the next generation of, uh, of researchers interested in Waldenstrom's along. So I think the exciting part is the more dollars IWMF has, the greater number of, of researchers can be applied to the field of, re, of Waldenstrom's and hopefully create a better outcome uh, for research in general. Thank you. Um, uh, that's very helpful in explaining things to people as far as how the process works. It's important that uh, they understand there's a lot of uh, effort that goes into um, collecting those proposals and reviewing them and then also on the part of the researchers who are, or then get funded. Um, it's exciting, uh, the, the progress that's been made, and uh, we hope to see more progress in the future, naturally. Um, right, and I think bottom line is, uh, you know, it's very important for this to be a very transparent uh, process, so we ensure that all of those that apply uh, get feedback from the research committee, so all of the comments that are made are sent back to the to the applicants that were unsuccessful, so that they would know how their, their project would be viewed as more uh, competitive uh, in the future if they address issues that were felt to be deficient. Thank you. Um, another couple of um, uh, research-related questions that uh, is a follow-up. Um, is there research being done in the relationship between WM and autoimmune disease? Uh, as many WM patients seem to suffer from both. Um, and uh, some say that when they become uh, when they become diagnosed with WM, uh, they feel that they have more uh, a worsening condition because of their autoimmune disease. 
Um, so is there any uh, research being done in that area? Right, there are, and there is. Um, uh, in fact, actually, there are a number of publications that are out there already. And uh, to tie into one of the earlier questions about collaboration, this came from a collaboration uh, of a um, uh, of an international uh, set of, of epidemiology studies where all of the data was pooled together with then a focus on uh, lymphoplasmacytic slash Waldenstrom's uh, lymphomas. And um, what they looked for then is exactly this question of compared to control patients or control people, not patients, and people that have Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, is there an association uh, with, uh, with having an autoimmune type of uh, problem in your history or currently at the time of diagnosis? And it was shown that there is a greater incidence of autoimmune um, uh, phenomenon in patients that have Waldenstrom's and a number of other kinds of lymphoma. And it seems to be the case that when you have autoimmune types of processes going on, your B cells are really kind of very active and uh, revved up by that process, and therefore they're at risk for making additional genetic mistakes, which can then cause them to end up with uh, diseases like Waldenstrom's. So two things that were interesting from that, that was an international collaboration of, of many thousands of patients and many thousands of control people, and it showed exactly the point that the uh, questioner is raising. Thank you. Uh, another follow-up question. Um, Regarding research, will there be upcoming uh, studies for cancer-targeting radiotherapeutic drugs for WM? Um, that's a good question, and the answer is probably possibly. There have been uh, radio, uh, therapy, you know, radio immunotherapies in the past, uh, agents such as Zevalin and Bexar, uh, which targeted CD20. Um, the challenge was is is that when it, um, when these uh, molecules bind to the cancer cell, they radiate the cancer cell, but they also radiate the neighborhood cells. And the problem with that is that if the bone marrow has lots of cancer cells, there is a lot of radiation that hits the normal bone marrow. So that does make it a little challenging for utilizing this particular approach. However, there are now new radioisotopes with uh, shorter uh, path lengths before they kind of run out of their radiation, and those may have merit in the future. But I would say probably it will be more useful in other lymphomas before it gets around to be treated in, in, in diseases like Waldenstrom's or myeloma where it's bone marrow centric. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of minutes left, so I think <clears throat> I'll get to the last slide here, the last question. And uh, uh, the, the, this last question is, is there, uh, also research related, is there research looking into diagnostic procedures for WM other than the usual bone marrow biopsy, uh, anything like cell-free DNA or the liquid biopsy as some people call it? Uh, and the answer is yes. And obviously bone marrow is nobody's most favorite thing, so if you could get away from doing those, that would be fantastic. So there is actually a very useful using cell-free DNA to be able to detect mutations like MYD88 and CXCR4, et cetera, in the peripheral blood. So I do see a real value for that. The only thing that might still make bone marrows necessary is we learn a lot from how many cells are present in the bone marrow. So until we know for a fact that cell-free DNA and all the volume thereof correlates directly with how many cancer cells are in the bone marrow, um, that may make the use of cell-free DNA something that we would do to monitor the disease rather than make the diagnosis of the disease. So I think there's a lot of research going on at this point, but we're not at the point where we would totally replace the typical bone marrow aspirin biopsy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Ansel. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to speak with us today and uh, address all of these questions. Um, you've managed to... Uh, answer each question in uh, a thoughtful and knowledgeable and informative matter, regardless of what it was that I threw at you. So I really appreciate that. And on behalf of, again, on behalf of all the WM patients and caregivers around the world, we appreciate your efforts both in treating patients and in research. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to mention to everyone that uh, this presentation will now be concluding. So please complete the short survey that appears. Um, then close out of the tab in your browser once you've done that and return to the auditorium for the next presentation. 
Um, the next presentation will be Ask the Doctors at 1215, and uh, that, always, uh, that always promises to be a lively discussion with uh, interesting interplay of, and different and uh, exchanges of opinions among our doctors panel. And Dr. Ansel will be back for that session also along with Dr. Trion and Dr. Castillo. So again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ansel. Thank you everyone for attending. And uh, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.